everyone have a right to participate, to create, to make it work for all of us. Not just for the black, not for white, not for anyone else, but for all working together. Daniel Boone, I, I really love that, that, that uh, series. Um, what happened was Ed Ames quit. And so uh, they asked me to come over and audition for the show. So I go over there and they had a guy named Yapit Koto was before me and he was so good, you know. And so they said, I said, well, that guy is so good. Why do you want me to do it? So they said, well, we, we want you to do it anyway. So I went, I did out my audition, you know. And so, and I went home and my agent, Jerry Levy called me and said, Rosie, you got the part. I said, wow. He said, that's it? I said, now nah, I got to do it. I got to, I, not only do I have the part, now I got to perform it, you know. So it was, it was really a thrill to work with Fess Barker and, and all the guys, uh, Jimmy Dean. And uh, it was just a wonderful time for me, Dobby Hinton, to, to learn about acting. I, I remember once we were doing a shot and Fess Parker was supposed to be pinning a medal on a guy. Well, of course, his back was to the camera and you know where you could see other than the guy, but he was putting that medal on and it fell to the ground, right? So of course, I start laughing. I'm laughing because the medal fell, not realizing that they won't even see it anyway. And so I thought that it was really funny, so they stopped the scene and they said that nobody sees it. And so we used to have a great time. Jimmy Dean and I did a lot of good stuff together and just, Working on that show was just really beautiful for me. I loved Fest Park. I loved that show. And uh, so it was just great. I loved that. You know, I never really thought about it because when we were shooting Daniel Boone, oh, that might have been something else. Uh, no, I didn't really think about I never really thought about that part as much as when I was in football because in football it was very noticeable. Uh, in most teams, if they carried ball, ball players, black ball players, they were only going to carry uh, five, and two of them was going to play the same position. So working in Daniel Boone, I already hosted my own television show. So I never really thought about it. Now, however, uh, uh, Mr. McPhee, who was uh, working for ABC, uh, his brother brought me over there to, to, to host a show for ABC because I guess the, 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 the governing body has said that there must be a black person from a minority community on television. And so they picked me, got, I just got hurt, and I retired from the Rams. So it was my time, but I never really thought about being uh, 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 one of a kind, uh, the, the, the first black to do this or that. I, I just always looked at it as I had an opportunity and I stepped in doubting that not about me being black. I was doubting the fact could I do this because that was not my nature. I was afraid to talk and all that. And yet, it was wonderful, wonderful training for me. I, I loved uh, Fess. I mean, he was a, a, a quiet spoken guy and he was always, you know, he'd give you uh, help if you needed help. And, but he was always very kind to the people that was working around him. And he had a lot of influence on the show and yet he didn't abuse anything in his, in his power that he had, but he was always trying to give people a chance to work. And I really appreciated that in Fest Parker. And, and certainly uh, when I heard that he had passed, Darby Hinton called me and said he had been with the family. And I just, I just, you know, it's too bad that people have to leave us, but he left a great legacy. He didn't try to be a star. He just played his part up to the hilt. He had this certain way of doing things uh, and it was just, it was just really great uh, to, to work with him because you were not under any pressure, but you knew that you had to try to make your part alive because that's the only way that you give other actors a chance to work off of your energy. And so you always at that point to try to perform your part to make it better. Fess Parker was proud of his family and uh, I admired him for that. And of course, when you're a star like that, uh, you get uh, opportunities all over the place. 
but he stayed close to the script. I mean, he never, I never see him varying, varying away from the, uh, the territory that he should be in terms of representing his family and, and the thing that that show represented. He was very out there in doing that. My, at the water with my mom, and she was kept in slavery, I thought. So I remember saying to the Daniel Boone that we gotta go get my mom. I found out where my mom was at. So we go down to this place where my mom is in this house by herself. And I said, Mom, I gotta, we gotta set, we gotta bring, make you free. And mom, mom, mom said, uh, at the water said, son, I've been free a long time. She showed us the papers that freed her. She had a paper that freed her from slavery. And so, but she was sick. So we were gonna take her back to the free land. And so on the way back, of course, she got very, very sick. And, and of course, my thoughts were, if someone had taken care of her out of, out of need, she would not have had died on the way there. So it really set me off in anger. And Fess Parker was trying to make me, bring me down and try to make me understand that this was a time when these things happened, but yet I got to see my mom, got to know that she was free and got to really spend some time with her and that I ought to be, you know, uh, uh, thankful for that. But I mean, I, I was doing things like turn the wagon over and of course they cut that out because they didn't want to show violence. They wanted to show a, a man that was crying because he lost his mom, but they didn't want to show violence because violence is very provocative in terms of other people who are going through situations and they feel that they've been wronged. So uh, it was through Daniel Boone that I, I learned a lot about Fess Parker. He had a quiet way, but he was strong in, in, in giving me help and trying to calm me down. Uh, today they don't do that. They, they show it because they are, to me it's like they're stirring up violence by saying things or doing things that will just make people go crazy. And I think that's um, not a good way to report. I mean, you always think about, I always, well, I always think about what's good for my country, what's good for my house, my house being my world, my country. So I always think about what can I do to make my house better, uh, to try to encourage people to realize that they are great people, they have great potentials, but that's something they, they have to develop. It's not because of what color you are that stop you now, that, that had been some, roadblocks, but greatness overcome roadblocks and, and, and make, make it to the top anyway, because talent, all it has to do is be developed and it will get you there. I, I wouldn't do shows that was that, was that way. I, I, you know, I, I had an opportunity to do some shows where, you know, I had to be shooting and doing all these things. And I said, nah, because I, I thought that a lot of young people, in fact, after that show at the Waters, I got a call from one of the Kennedy's kids, uh, Bobby Kennedy's kid said to me, um, did your mama die? And, and of course I'm, I'm shook because I said, what? He said, did your mama die? He said, I saw you on TV. And then I relaxed because he's talking about the show that he saw on TV that my mom died at the waters. And I explained to him that it was just a show but it also make you realize kids watching a show don't understand that there are actors. Uh, even when um, the great uh, roots was being shown, I got a call from prisons and these guys were saying they was getting ready to ride in prisons. And I said, what are, you, what are you riding about? He said, do you see how the white people are treating my people? And I said, man, wait a minute, hold it just a second. I said, all oh, you guys, realize this. These are actors. This is not real. They said, it's not. I said, no, man, it's not real. And so, you know, I was able to calm some of that down. But people don't realize, actors and actresses need to realize that people watching them, they don't always know that it's an act. You stir up the inner feeling of people and you're making them realize that they got this, this, this anger and this power and this ability within themselves to do something wrong or right, depending upon who, who's motivating them. 
And so uh, actors and actors, and I mean, they got to play the parts. But I, I think also their life should also be reflective of that it was a part. And I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed a lot today that some of the, 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 the way some of the, the people of notoriety care of themselves because they're doing things that cause other people to slip. I mean, for instance, if I'm watching a football game and a guy take and slam a quarterback, slam him, well, probably the next week you're going to see a kid in high school or the Little League slam a quarterback. Now, it's a flag in the profession, but these kids don't realize that that's very dangerous to slam a quarterback or someone like that who have no way of protecting themselves because they're protecting the ball or whatever. So you have to really watch your image. Not that you can do anything because of what you are, you're going you're gonna to see it. But the idea that try to live your life so that other can, can follow you and, and feel safe for their children. Daniel Boone was a man. He was a great man. <laughs> well, Daniel Boone is like a, a uh, fable. And uh, the song was about him. There's all these things about Daniel Boone, what the great thing that he did for people in his lifetime. And this uh, television show was uh, uh, Daniel Boone. They were seeing Daniel Boone in the flesh. It wasn't the one that they read about was Daniel Boone being played by Fess Parker and portrayed very well. So people connected with that, and that's what made it really popular. Then they had Ed Aim was great. He was a great singer as well. And so they had all these people, and then I came on uh, uh, playing my part of the Daniel Boone series, and so Jimmy Dean and many others. So it was great at the Waters. So to me, Daniel Boone was a... Uh, a time in history that had great influence on people. And to do that kind of show made you feel like you were, you were doing something to help benefit our nation. I mean, I was not aware of that. Uh, what, I, what I've always tried to do is I try to live a life when I have an occasion to have an opportunity like this. This is a great opportunity is to try to say to people that you are precious and valuable and unique and there's no one in the world like you. And you have a chance to do something with your life that's going to benefit all of us. A, con a concept that I learned as a football player, team. And, and to me, we live in a, in a nation that need teamwork. If we work together, we can change the world. I can't change it, you can't change it, but we can. And so always my thoughts are, how can I encourage people to realize that they're not, they're not just a, a, a stump on a log. They have great work to do with where they are. I, I remember Bobby Kennedy saying to a lady one time, was asking him, what can I do to help change people? And she, he said, you work with the people that you know. I work with the people that I know in my frame of time. Where I am in this life, I'm a senator. I can... I have great influence and people hear me, but you have the same influence where you are with the people that you know. It's all about creating that flow that builds and builds and builds until it washes down all these rough places in our life and our system that makes it beneficial to all. And so I was very thankful for what he said to that lady. And so I always thought about my role. My role was to live the life that I'm living, to try to be influential in the way I live my life, to try to say a good word, take the time to speak to people, pick on people, just because I love people. And, and, and I think a lot of times that people look at themselves because they say, I'm not a football player, I'm not a this, and I'm not a that, I'm not a this. If I was this or this or this, I'd have an opportunity to do this or this. And I'm saying, but you can do what you do while you, where you are. You don't have to worry about those things. If you do what you do where you are, the team will take care of the rest. Oh, that was, that was probably one of my first or second time in the movies, on television series. I really, really enjoyed being with those guys. I mean, they had this, this series, Wild Wild West was a great series. And of course, I was not a good guy in, in that one. But uh, I love work, because I was in awe of those guys, that here were these guys, 
as, as big actors as they were. And when I got to see him in, in, in person, he was small, he was a short guy. And, but the role that he played was just really beautiful. And, and, and all the guys that was in it, that series, it, it was a great thing and people loved that show. And so I, I, just being in it, people, I also did one, uh, I, I'm jumping, I did Man From UNCLE. And, and I was in New York, I was, I was getting gas in New York City. And a guy said to me, Rosie Greer, I saw you in Man From UNCLE. Man, that never crossed my mind that how big that show was as Wild Wild West. That these shows had great impact across the nation. People were watching it all over the place. So you go on a show, you don't realize that it's going to hit coast to coast or worldwide for that matter. But it did. And, and, and those actions that they perform was real in terms of entertaining to those people who were watching. Every week they couldn't wait to get on, 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 turn the TV on to watch. Kojak, um, I, I, I like, I really love Telly Savalas and all the guys that, uh, uh, Telly was a great guy. I really liked him. Uh, but I was a, a, a bounty hunter. And uh, I remember once I had to go pick a guy up out of New York. His name was Bill Duke. You know Bill Duke? The, the great director, actor, and writer and all that. So I had to go and, and bring him back to, uh, I think, California. He had jumped bail or something. And so I went, and, and, and of course, I always run into Kojak. And uh, it, it, it was always great. Uh, he had such a way with him that always made his series really, really good. And so I did a number of those, and I, I did a spinoff was going to be my own series. And Kojak was going, I mean, uh, Telly was going to be like one of the uh, producers or one of the owners of that show. But it didn't go because I, I don't think uh, they really pushed it to get to the point. Maybe they didn't think I was good enough or whatever. Uh, I'm saying that, but I thought I was good enough. Uh, so it was, it was really a joy to work on, on, on Kojak. I mean, it really, really uh, made me feel like I was getting there. I was learning how to act. I, I always got lost in the scene though. When they we shooting a scene in New York and they send me off in a car, uh, a friend of mine named Wally Charles would always say, you better watch him because he was my stand in. Wally Charles was my stand in. And so I'd go off in a, and at one time they had me in a little old Volkswagen and I drove off, drove off and I got lost in New York City. It was so hilarious. I was lost for like two hours before, I, before they finally got me back. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I love I love uh, working on, on Kojak. It was a great show, and Tell Us About It was outstanding because they hold you in suspense. You don't know the answer. You get to to think about who could have done it. Uh, how are they going to get the information that they need to solve the puzzle? And they're all trying to solve this puzzle. Why did that Why did that person die? Who, who did it? What did he have to gain by it? What did he do it out of, uh, of hatred, out of fear? Or was he trying to gain something? Was he out in the band of something? So they usually work it around where it proves out to be real in terms of how it come about happening. Um, so those were always very interesting to me. Um, I didn't want to be the one who would kill but I always would want to be one that solved the problems. And I tried to stay out of uh, movies where there were a lot of killing. So I, I, I didn't like that. Yeah, remember this. In Kojak, I didn't carry a weapon. Every time you see me with a weapon, I was putting it away. So they developed a karate uh, part for me that I could use all these karate and judo things that would help me. Uh, so I never had to put out my weapon out to shoot anyone. So I never did that. I, uh, I, I just didn't want to carry a weapon because there again, I was always thinking about the kids because of football who would know me and I didn't want them to see me carrying a weapon. I see a lot of actors playing roles and I ask myself, 
why would they play that role? Uh, what was it about that role? See, they're thinking about expanding their repertoire of acting ability, expanding their roles by doing these, these things. Now, I know that that's a lot of what they're thinking, but I, I think of the influence and some of the verbiage that they use, I, you never would see me cussing in a film or, or in anything like that. You would never see me doing that. I don't, I don't swear. And so I did once, but, but every time I would swear when I was a little kid, when I heard someone, I'd have to pray to God, the Lord forgive me for my sin, and, but, and he did. But, but I, I learned to, um, uh, I stopped at one time. I remember once my wife and I got in an argument and I said a swear word, and she said it right back to me. And my son was looking at us. And I said, I will never ever again swear. And I stopped right then. I never did again. Same way with smoking. I was smoking once, and uh, my son said, Dad, why are you smoking? And I looked at him, I said, I quit. Out the window, and I was a litter. I threw it out the window and I never smoked again. No, you, you know, I used to come out to California and I went uh, down to the set of Untouchables. I, I, I went down to that set and, and I was talking to those guys. Um, uh, well, I can't think of the lead actor. Robert Stack. Robert Stack. I was talking to him and, 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 and them, the whole group of them and just there. And, and, and one of them asked me, why don't you uh, act? Uh, I mean, I started laughing, you know. And, they, and they, so they told me what you have to do. You got to uh, get a part and you get a, a screen actor's card and all that stuff. So, so I, I, I went someplace and I tried out for a part, right? Then I went back to New York. I was playing New York Giants. And I got a call to come try for a part, but I'm in New York, I'm, I'm not coming back to California for a part. So anyway, um, I came back here and I started doing my own television show. And that's where the one when Ed Ames, uh, uh, I'd done uh, uh, that one man from Uncle and a couple of that one with Wild Wild West. And then uh, Ed Ames left Daniel Boone. And when they gave me that part, as I said earlier, that I said, now, nah, oh boy, I got to do the part now. And, uh, but, I, but I learned a lot of things through the Daniel Boone series. And uh, so it meant a lot to me to, to be able to make my, my mind, my body, all I had to do, I was always afraid of talking. But if someone would give me the lines, all I got to do is learn the lines and make them real, man, that's, that's acting. So to me, it was like practicing how to talk, how to say things. And I eventually got it to the point where when I would speak, I always speak from my heart. So I tried to make my acting come from my heart, make it real to me. When I would hear it with my own ears, I would know that it was real. And so that was my, my fun part, is to make myself believe what I'm saying. And so it was always good. And that, that's when I began to realize that's what it was about. If you wanted to act, learn how to speak so that people understood what you were saying and learn how to say it because someone wrote it. And if it didn't fit your mouth, it didn't sound right to you, then you have to change to make it fit like you sound in your own character. And so that was always my, my, my thought always that I'm learning something great and through that, man, I cannot tell you how it helped me. I, I didn't think about it. Um, the way I got into it, I was, I was in Beverly Hills, and I was driving down Beverly Boulevard, and I saw these, no, it was Little Santa Monica, and I saw these ladies going into this, this shop and they all had these uh, canvases. 
And so I stopped my car, took my guitar out of the back and put it on my shoulder and went in the shop and there was all these ladies in there. They were all doing needlepoint. Of course, I had to pretend that I knew about needlepointing. So I said, well, let me, can I see that? And I look on, I look on the back. I said, oh, you, 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 made, you made some mistakes in the back. And so these women in there said to me, Rosie, we know you don't know anything about needlepointing. So if you come over, we'll teach you. So when you come in, you'll be a, have a knowledge about what you're talking about. So I started going over there, going over there, going over, and they was teaching me, teaching me, teaching me. So after a while, I, I got, to, I really liked it. I liked doing needlepoint. So one day they asked me to come over. There was a, a, a lady that they wanted me to come over and take a picture with. So I go over there, they take this picture. I thought they was gonna hang it up in, in, in the building. End up in the society section in the New York Times. There I am needlepoint with this lady. Now, of course, I got a lot of reactions from the guys. You just ruined our image. And, and, and it dawned on me that how could this ruin your image if you need upon it? Or cooking, or sewing, or whatever. So I'm thinking, if, if that's your image, you're in trouble. If that destroys your image, you're in trouble. A uh, little later on, I, I did a, uh, uh, an album called Free to Be with Marlo Thomas and Friends. Sing a song called It's All Right to Cry. These two things made great impression on young people. Uh, one said if Rosie Greer can, can, can uh, cry, if Rosie Greer can needlepoint, then it must be all right for me to play the violin. And so, because uh, I would cry very easily. I remember once we were doing a television show in, um, uh, I think it was in Vegas. And uh, we were taping the fearsome force and was Deacon Joan, Marilyn Lonson, and Lamar Lundy. So we were all talking, being interviewed on this show. And so Deacon Joan gets up and he said, well, you know, I went through a problem and I didn't tell these guys about it. He said, I, I had prostate cancer. Well, of course, that hit me in my heart that he was going through that. And he didn't tell us about it. And I was working with the Prostate Cancer Foundation, and yet he didn't tell me about it, that he was going through, yet I pushed him and pushed him and pushed him till he finally went and got tested and found out that he had it. Didn't even tell me that he had it. And so I started crying. I mean, dead is boo -oing. And it was, just, it was just amazing how emotional I get at times. Sometimes my wife, she, I'll read something in the paper and I, I start crying, I can't stop it. And she'll come and hug me or, or, or give me a candy bar. <laughs> no, not really. Uh, but she, she tried to comfort me uh, because I feel, I have this great feeling for people that are going through trying times. And so needle pointing and, and, and things like that, all it does is kind of relax you and, and get you uh, into yourself, into doing stuff, you're focusing on these things and you get away from all the other things go away. M my thought was, first, I didn't know Bobby was dead. I didn't know that it was fatal shot. Had I known it was fatal shot, I wouldn't have done any differently. Uh, my point was to hold him, and a a as I said in the in in process, I pulled him up on his table, and I wrapped his legs up so he couldn't kick. And there was a guy standing next to me, and George Plimpton was struggling trying to get the gun out of his hand. And George couldn't do it, he, he was that strong. So all I did was put my hand over the weapon, I, I pulled the trigger back so it wouldn't fire, and I rinsed it out of his hand, put it in my pocket. And then all the people that was out of position initially, they caught up. Well, Bobby was down, they couldn't help him. Uh, Sir Han, Sir Han was on his table, and they came to get after him, and they start trying to plummet him. And so what I did, I just fought them off because I was not going to allow them to commit a murder on this man. So I protected him. Guy standing next to me was trying to twist his legs. So I kicked that guy. And as they realized 
that I was fighting against them, they, 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 they stood back, they stopped. But the point is that I didn't want to demonstrate a way to handle a situation like this was to get even. Uh, though he had heard a, a friend that we all loved and the damage that was done uh, after we found out that it was fatal, it, it made a big impact on our nation, on our world, and all on that family. To take away that man out of that family was a terrible thing. But yet, uh, we had an opportunity to say, we do, our, we do our thing in a different way. We don't take something, a weapon and shoot people for, that we disagree with. You, you see, I, when I played football, I got to go there. It's all about the team. Um, there were some positions that blacks were not going to play. I should say African-American, but I say blacks because of my right. Um, they were not going to play quarterback. They were not going to play center. And were not going to play linebacker. Why? The assumption was they weren't smart enough. I got to tell you, man, God doesn't limit brains. <laughs> there's, there's no one smarter than anyone else in any color. He gives it to us in all colors. So when, when, when you look at that, when we begin to recognize the fact that this team, it's not just one thing, it's black, white, uh, uh, religions, Jews, Gentiles, Greek, or whatever. That's the team. It's not an American team. It's a worldwide team working on worldwide problems. This is a worldwide, worldwide problem we're going through. This is the famine. We're going through a famine. And when you're in a famine, one, you learn to share, you learn to encourage, you learn to work together. So we begin to realize leadership comes from ability to lead. Here's a man that was educated, Harvard, with, with, with incredible credentials and spoke well, learned to organize young people, get them involved in the game, let them work for America to change the landscape, to be in to say, everyone have a right to participate, to create, to make it work for all of us, not just for the black, not for white, not for anyone else, but for all working together for the Indians and for say, Spanish and all of those people working together. We are the team. It has all colors, many colors, the rainbow. <laughs>